So we're looking at the uh, specifics of the clavicle, scapula and humerus. And we're going to start by going through some distinguishing, distinguishing features on the scapula. So the scapula, this uh, scapula's got a lot of different processes sticking out of it here. And this one at the front, as you feel the front of your shoulder, is called the coracoid process. This becomes important for a lot of, uh, a lot of different muscle origins and attachments, and also a lot of different ligaments attach at this point here. So this is the coracoid process. Slightly um, superior to this and you know, posterior towards the back, so we're talking up and back from that coracoid process, is another process called the acromion. Again, very important, particularly for a lot of, um, uh, there's a joint that takes place here, there's also some, a lot of ligaments that attach to the acromion. So these two things, the coracoid process and the acromion, very important to remember. Here we've got the actual socket part of the shoulder. This is called the glenoid cavity. Uh, and again, the humerus head comes in here at the glenoid cavity forming that ball and socket joint of the shoulder. We've got, if we look at the back of the scapula, scapular spine runs across the back of the scapula and you can even feel that if you feel your shoulder across that back the back ridge of your shoulder you'll actually be feeling the scapular spine we've got three fossas on the scapula above the spine of the scapula we've got a fossa called the supraspinatus fossa so let's just break down that word supraspinatus supra comes from the word superior so above the spine and spinatus coming from the word spine. So supraspinatus coming from supraspinatus, so above the spine. Below the spine, we've got the infraspinatus fossa. And again, the infra comes from inferior to the spine, so infraspinatus, infraspinatus. Underneath the scapula, we've got what's called the subscapularis fossa. So the subscapularis, meaning sub, meaning underneath, underneath the scapula. If we look closely at the humerus now, humerus has got some distinguishing features. Number one, we've got the head of the humerus, which is this, uh, the big sort of ball round spherical object. And that head of the humerus, see, you can see fits nicely into that uh, glenoid cavity. And together, this is the shoulder joint, or you know, more correctly known as the glenohumeral joint. The gleno comes from the glenoid cavity, and the humero comes from the, uh, the, the humerus. So glenohumeral joint, glenoid cavity, and humerus. We know this is the head of the humerus because it's got this narrow neck section, which is actually also the uh, most frequently fractured area of the humerus. Now, if we look at dislocations, uh, if we dislocate this, uh, this shoulder joint in any way, it's, it's inclined to come inferiorly, so it'll come down, and also anteriorly, so it'll sort of pop through that section there. That's got a lot to do with a, a number of things. Uh, number one, obviously, uh, if we're trying it up, there's a bone in the way here, the acromion definitely adds a bit of stability um, in that uh, superior direction. Um, and uh, the nature of the back as well, a lot of musculature around the back, also uh, the way the bone locks in, it's harder to pop out back, very much has a tendency to come down and forward or inferiorly and anteriorly. If we look at the clavicle now in relation to this shoulder joint, that uh, the end of the clavicle actually actually links in with the acromion there, and that forms a little gliding plane joint at the, uh, at the acromial end of the clavicle. So just one surface sort of touches up against the other surface like so. Now at the other end of the clavicle, we've got this sort of unique, uh, this is like a half a saddle joint, which makes the full saddle joint when it attaches to the top of the sternum at the manubrium there. So this, uh, this is called the sterno sternoclavicular joint because it's going from the sternum to the clavicle and that's a shallow saddle joint. Shallow saddle joint uh, makes it a bit of a rarity because typically saddle joints are able to you know, uh, have, move on two axes so sometimes they're you know, flexion extension, abduction, adduction and that's pretty much it. But this very shallow saddle joint allows for slight rotation so it actually works on, a, it's multi-axial, it works on three axes. And in this case, having the combination of both a uh, plane joint at one end of the clavicle and a shallow saddle at the other, it's got some unique movements that take place at this joint, or a combination of these two joints. Firstly, these joints allow elevation of the shoulder, so that's when you shrug your shoulder up, it goes like that, depression, when your shoulder moves down, 
protraction, which is like drawing your shoulder forward, so it looks like that, and retraction, which is squaring off your shoulders or dragging your shoulders back. And again, the shallow, the shallow saddle adds a little bit of rotation. So the movements possible at the clavicle, which is a combination of both ends, would be elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, and rotation. 